Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us today for our session with Synergos and UNICEF on challenges and joint opportunities in the distribu distribution of a global COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Kate Zarniak, and I'm Managing Director of Synergos' Global Philanthropist Circle. I'm based here in Santa Cruz, California. And so hello to all my West Coasters, if you're joining us today. We will have 60 minutes, so it's a tight schedule. We'll start with some introductory remarks, move into a Q&A, and end with a call to action. With that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Peggy Delaney, who is the founder and chair of Synergos, to give us some welcoming comments. So Peggy, over to you. Thank you, Kate, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many faces that I know and names that I've heard of but maybe haven't met. And you're all very welcome to this important call. Um, I also wanted to thank Ron Bohm in particular for sparking the idea of having this first gathering, um, which is jointly uh, organized by UNICEF and Synergos, and in particular uh, to thank our Executive Director Henrietta Four for coming forth for this, and also the wonderful speakers Eva and Abu, who from whom we'll hear quite soon. Um, this has obviously been a very difficult time for everybody in the world. I'm sure if we shared stories, no one would be out, out of stories that, that represent the difficulty for all of us at this time. And this particular gathering focuses on an extremely important one because the, the result of the crisis of COVID-19 has been um, devastating around the world, including in our own country, which should have done much better. And um, what we look forward to is a dialogue uh, once we kind of hear the dimensions of the, of the issue and um, a, a discussion about how we in civil society, uh, we philanthropists, can participate in the particularly important thing of getting the vaccine out worldwide. So I would like to now turn it back um, to my colleagues and um, just say that I hope this will lead to a really good discussion and to some outcomes in which we can continue to collaborate in the future. So thank you so much and back to you. Thank you, Peggy. And with that, it's my pleasure to now invite the Executive Director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, to share with us her remarks. Henry, Executive Director Four, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, thank you to everyone at Synergos uh, for organizing this discussion. We have a massive challenge before us, and so we could use every ounce of help. So please think with us think of ways that we can help each other to get this accomplished for our world. And I would also like to add to Peggy's comments about thanking Ron Bohm, um, an old friend of mine, uh, to um, uh, introduce us and to make sure that we were talking to all of you and telling you what lay ahead. So with that, um, may I begin. We very much appreciate this community and of course our friends at Gates Foundation for all the work that you have done to draw attention and more support to the greatest vaccination drive in history. UNICEF takes on this lead role uh, in a way that we carry history. It's a historic initiative and we need all hands on deck. Ron and I are both sailors, so please come join us on this sailing ship. It's a chance for all of us to be a part of history and to demonstrate the power of private philanthropy. I look forward to outlining not just UNICEF's role in this initiative, but your role and how you can lend your support, your influence, and your voice. And I look forward to the discussion today. So from the very start, UNICEF has been doing our part to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, to protect children and their families, and to safeguard essential health, nutrition, and education services. And now we've been entrusted to lead the procurement and the delivery of vaccines on behalf of the COVAX facility to over 100 countries. We are aiming for 2 billion doses in the calendar year 2021, 
which will double UNICEF's annual delivery of vaccine to more than 4 billion doses. So why UNICEF? We are the largest single vaccine buyer in the world. Over the decades, we've built a unique and long-standing expertise in the procurement and logistics to help children in need. Every year we procure about 2 billion doses of vaccines on behalf of nearly 100 countries. These are for regular childhood immunizations from measles to polio. And along with our friends at the Gates Foundation, we are the main procurement partner for Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. In the past 20 years, we have helped to reach more than 760 million children with life-saving vaccines, preventing more than 13 million deaths. And now we are working with Gavi to lead the procurement and delivery of COVID-19 vaccines through the COVAX facility. The scale is massive. 186 countries are now part of the facility. By the end of the year, we hope to distribute 2 billion doses of the vaccine. But as any vaccine, the procurement and delivery are just part of the effort. We need to make sure that countries have good cold chains, that their health workers are trained and ready to deliver the vaccine, that health authorities develop equitable distribution plans based on need and in what order they need to be delivered that health workers are prioritized in the rollout so they can get back to supporting children and mothers with other critical health services that they need from vaccines to obstetric care to preventing malnutrition. And that communities understand the importance and safety of vaccines and that they accept them, that everyone gets vaccinated. As I said, it's a massive undertaking and it is a critical part of UNICEF's role at the country level, both national and subnational, where we work with WHO to get countries ready to successfully deploy the vaccine. Vaccines save lives, but we must save lives equitably. That's what COVAX is all about, ensuring that low and middle income countries receive the vaccines too that the light at the end of the tunnel is a light that shines for everyone. To get the job done, we're working with manufacturers on procurement, with transportation, freight, and logistics partners on delivery, and with storage partners to keep our cold chains effective in protecting the vaccines every step of the way. And we want to ensure that other vital health services continue as the rollout happens. We cannot risk trading one disease for another, and babies still need to be born safely. So throughout, we want to work with all of you. Philanthropy will play a critical role in this massive effort. At the end of the session, I will outline where we need your help specifically. But for now, I'm grateful to all of you for being with us today and to learn more about this historic moment. We wanted to take a chance because we do have so many of us joining from all over the world to do a short community building exercise. And while we are looking ahead to 2021, we all are coming off of at least 11 months of a pandemic. Uh, I'm sure for all of us, the challenges have been immense. And yet we are all still here today. We've shown up and we've shown up because we believe we can still do something. And that to me and to all of us here speaks to our incredible resilience. So my ask is a short one, but that you could all please re refer to the chat box and my colleagues will put a link in there to a survey. And could you share with us in an anonymous open-ended format, as the world turned upside down because of COVID-19, how have you stayed resilient these last 10 months? And what we'll do is we'll share your responses as they come in. And we welcome Peggy and ED4, please, if any of these speak to you to reflect on them. But to just again reiterate for those who haven't seen the chat, as the world turned upside down, how have you stayed resilient these last 10 months? And we will begin sharing the responses as you come in and reflect.
I appreciate to limiting doom scrolling. Thank you to whoever wrote that. sense of purpose, family and friends. Personal practices can seem to be coming up quite a bit and focus on community. And nature, that is a very strong theme here as we're seeing. Hmm. More time for thinking and learning. I'm seeing a lot also of meditation and inner work practices to help keep us grounded. And I'm seeing also in the chat, someone put a long daily cycle exercise as much as we can. I know personally, I'm, I appreciate any chance I can to hike up a hill <laughs> and hike as long as I can. Thank you for these. These are wonderful. And feel free too to keep sharing as we move on to the next portion of our conversation. But for all of us, I hope that despite the challenges that we can continue, even as we head into coming up on a full year of this, to hold on to these practices that help us stay resilient because we'll need it going forward. Um, and it helps us keep that hope and opportunity and optimism that's required for this effort. So now I will pop it back to Liz officially um, and then have as an introduction to our dialogue, a short video that demonstrates the work that lies ahead against COVID-19 and why UNICEF was tasked with this mission on behalf of the COVAX facility. Great, thank you, Kate. So we can absolutely roll that video as a start. Do you wanna begin with the video and then we'll move into the rest of the discussion. Thank you. All over the world, children's lives have been interrupted by COVID-19. While the pandemic has spread, UNICEF has stood by the most vulnerable children, working to safeguard their education, nutrition, and essential health services. Now, together with partners in the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and COVAX, UNICEF is working to ensure countries have safe, fast, and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines when the initial doses become available. But unless we protect health workers, children can't access life-saving services and will fall even further behind. Right now, UNICEF distributes more than 2 billion routine vaccines every year. With our systems and expertise, we can double that in the world's largest and fastest procurement and supply of vaccines. We are stockpiling syringes and aiming to deliver 1 billion syringes in 2021 for the COVID-19 vaccine injections and making sure there is the cold chain to preserve the vaccine. We are training health workers and strengthening systems so that every investment made today builds a better tomorrow. Unprecedented times demand extraordinary actions. Together, we can do this. Thank you, everybody. And um, great. Thank you for that video. My name is Liz Case. I haven't introduced myself to many of you yet. I work with UNICEF. I'm part of the team um, that is sort of been is honored enough to be to be helping support this rollout. And what I wanted to do now is just kind of facilitate a, a conversation a presentation from two very important colleagues of mine, as well as follow up with a Q&A. So as um, Abu and Eva are speaking, please feel free to put any questions into the chat box and we're gonna do our very best to get to those questions and answer them for you. Um, but I wanna start by introducing uh, Eva Kadilik, who is the Director of Supply Division. And I think along with Abu, I think they, they, they deal with COVAX all day and I expect they dream about it all night. So they're the perfect people to tell us about this. And I wanna hand over to you, Eva, for your perspective from the Supply Division side, over to you. 
Thank you so much, Liz. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much, Kate and Peggy, for this uh, invitation. We're very happy to be with you all and for all the organizers at Synagogue for convening this important event and gathering us, as the video said, together. So this is really fantastic to get together and, and discuss in these very important times that we are all uh, with the COVID-19. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to uh, all of you about the important role of UNICEF in the COVAX facility, which our executive director uh, outlined uh, just earlier. Um, I'm joining here today from UNICEF supply division here in Copenhagen, was at the video that you just watched <laughs> right uh, before. Uh, it's the home of the largest humanitarian warehouse um, in the world. Each year, we procure around $4 billion of goods and services to support our UNICEF programs in more than 150 countries around the world. Um, the teams, you can imagine that the teams here have been really heavily engaged in the COVID-19 response over the past year, um, securing, procuring, and shipping supplies uh, ranging from PPE to diagnostics to therapeutics to oxygen. And most recently, we are playing a leading role, as ED4 said, in the COVAX facility, uh, which is the focus also of today's discussion. You heard from our executive director for that COVAX will be the largest and the fastest procurement and supply operation ever. Uh, for UNICEF and for the world. It is really a mammoth task and a critical, uh, very critical moment in the public health history. And um, UNICEF is really playing a key role in both upstream engagement uh, with manufacturers, with transport industry, but also downstream engagement with countries. The sense of urgency is really very high. Uh, Liz said that we are dreaming, actually we're dreaming of every well-being uh, of every child, and we think that having, getting this uh, COVID-19 vaccine roll out is really um, the key to unlocking those essential services for children. Uh, and the timelines is unlike uh, any we have faced until before. So let me take a few moments just to give you an update on the status and the latest development. So, as of, as of today, the COVAX facility has secured 2 billion doses of vaccines via advanced purchase agreement uh, to target 20% of population in the COVAX participating countries by 2021. Last year, we have joined, we, together with PAHO, we have issued a joint tender on behalf of the COVAX uh, facility, and we have invited uh, COVID-19 vaccine developers to submit a proposal for supply. We received an overwhelming response of more than 30 responses so far, which is a very positive news, but also an indication in terms of volumes that we have received, which shows that we are in track to achieve the target volumes of 2 billion doses by 2021. Uh, we are working uh, really um, hard with manufacturers to establish supply agreements. Uh, with those that are going also to be soon as well that the show approved and uh, ready as soon as the doses are allocated and countries are ready to receive them. And I'm sure I will speak about uh, all of the country readiness, which is a, a massive uh, effort underway. Uh, the situation is really evolving quite quickly. The rollout of the first COVID vaccines to this uh, first wave countries is expected actually in the month of February to start. We are already putting underway all the efforts uh, as we speak right now, so that countries are ready to, to receive vaccines. Um, however, we are facing a lot of challenges, as you can imagine, uh, because the bulk of the doses in 2021 uh, might not be necessarily available until the second half of the year. We see that more than around 10% of the annual supply will be available in the first half of this year. So therefore, uh, we are working very closely with manufacturers and donors also to uh, really uh, influence and accelerate access to COVAX towards, uh, in terms of vaccines towards the first half of this year. Uh, but vaccine doses are just one part of the puzzle. Uh, many other elements must be in place to really effectively administer these life-saving vaccines. 
UNICEF is procuring and we are delivering related supplies, and this includes syringes, safety boxes, PPEs, to protect the health care workers in order for them to administer the vaccines. We have uh, prepositioned, as it was also in the video, uh, almost more than half a million syringes for rapid distribution, so they are there in the countries uh, when the vaccines arrive, and this is very important, but also in terms of cold chain, which is a very critical element, um, vaccine needs to be stored at specific temperatures uh, during transportation, and this requires equipment such as fridges, uh, freezers, cold boxes and carriers. So the good news is that our investments over the past three years in the cold chain infrastructure will absolutely serve us today. Uh, for example, we have uh, deployed and upgraded uh, 84,000 vaccine refrigerators have already been purchased in 90, uh, 69 countries um, with, and they are equipped with solar technology. But again, uh, this is, there is more to be done obviously, and uh, there are also a lot of challenges with regards to vaccines and technologies that requires ultra cold chain temperature control, such as at minus 70 uh, storage. So we are also working to make sure that countries that are receiving these technologies have also the ultra cold chain solution. Short shelf life and non-standard syringes are other challenges that are adding to the complexities, uh, but we are all working together to align the immunization, procurement and delivery strategies so that we can maximize doses and avoid any wastages. Um, because even though we are also in a global supply shortages, this is very, very important, but also under num uh, normal circumstances, this is always very important. Finally, a few words about the logistics. ED4 mentioned earlier the delivery of vaccines and accompanying supplies. It's a really a massive complex operation, but we are working very closely with airlines and logistics providers, and we have put in place contractual arrangements to really prioritize the COVID-19 vaccines to our countries. This is the moment where, um, together, as the video said, we can make a choice for the future, for a future to build better, stronger, and imagine a better future for children to strengthen our system that will serve us in the decades to come. System that can be sustainable for immunization programs and ultimately save more children lives. Really looking forward to doing so together with all of you there and your community. Thank you. Over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Eva. Thanks for that. Um, I don't work on the supply division side, but I do want to say how impressive it is what, what you guys are doing there. It, it, you do get the impression when you see the team at work that you're being invited to take a drink of water from a fire hose. But actually, this is a group of people who really have done this before. And I think it's really impressive to see how it all comes together, all the complexity in a way that is manageable. Um, there are a lot of peaks to climb, but um, thank you, Eva, for that introduction on what you're doing. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Abu, Abu Campo, who is our Global Director of Health in UNICEF, and he can give us a perspective on then the, the in-country logistics and the kind of work that we have to do in all these different countries with different ways of working, different contexts. Um, so over to you, Abu, for your, your comments. Thank you, Liz, um, uh, and good morning. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you so much, Peggy, as well, uh, for the invitation and to the organizers of Synergos uh, for convening this important meeting. Um, as UNICEF, as you know, we are present in 192 countries, but not just at the capital. I think in many of those countries, we have the largest footprint of the UN agencies and sometimes even more than the, uh, of the, uh, some of the NGOs. Uh, with many sub offices to be closer to the populations and community we are serving. Since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the health team has been extremely busy, uh, being one of the first responders uh, at the beginning of the crisis. We have we helped at the beginning in identifying in tracing cases, uh, community awareness raising, uh, wherever we are or wherever the, the, the communities are, installing hand washing stations in public places. In Afghanistan, where a couple of months ago, I was still the representative 
uh, our teams went throughout Afghanistan to inform communities, distribute pro personal, protec uh, personal protection equipment, soap and face mask uh, in Taliban control areas, as well as in government control areas. Uh, in many countries, health teams operate in a similar way uh, to prevent the disease from spreading. All these collaborations, all this has been done in collaboration with the incredible support of EVA, uh, Supply Division Copenhagen. I think they have been very critical to us, but all our regional and headquarter office. As we heard from ED4, our executive director, and the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine will be a daunting task, in particular at country level, and we cannot do it alone. And this needs to be done without necessarily diverting existing resources from other important programs in a timely manner. UNICEF has been very outspoken uh, at the beginning of the crisis of making sure that basic social services are maintained and that we're not basically diverting uh, all our attention and all our finances uh, towards COVID-19 and then neglecting uh, you know, um, other essential services like maternal health, child health, um, um, uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, because otherwise uh, it would have been increasing the death toll or just shifting the death toll from COVID-19 to another areas, but with uh, uh, bigger death rates for children. For countries to get ready uh, when the vaccines will be available through the COVAX facility, funding, funding needs to be in countries now. We cannot wait until the vaccine is actually available. Uh, the experience that we had in countries uh, many times is that big financial institutions who are willing to support are very heavy and slow to release funds. Um, even, if, even when the, recipi the recipient is actually UNICEF to help them in the implementation. The example was at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, PPEs, for example, UNICEF had to pre-finance a large number of uh, uh, equipment and uh, personal protective equipment uh, in order for countries to receive them in time as the money was available in bank accounts, but was not basically released to basically make those purchases. And I think um, this flexibility has been made basically available through the systems where, uh, within UNICEF. In country logistics uh, for 92 of the poorest and low and middle income countries represents um, a bill of 2 billion US dollar just to manage the in-country logistics of the rollout of those 2 billion vaccines which we are talking about. Uh, part of it will be covered uh, by institutions like Gavi and the World Bank, but there are still gaps. And what is important again, as I said, this funding needs to be in-country as soon as possible. Uh, we have done uh, a readiness assessment for the different countries, um, and we are still far away of actually 100% ready. Uh, national plans, uh, are in place in the countries, but coaching equipment needs, still needs to be beefed up when the, uh, uh, as soon as um, now needs to be beefed up now, so that when the vaccines will be rolled out, they can be safely uh, transported and uh, to the end point users for immunization, but also trainings of healthcare workers. And very, very important is the communication aspect. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation about the vaccines, about COVID-19. And I think it's important that these issues are addressed. Uh, and UNICEF is basically working through their country offices with governments to basically uh, get those countries ready uh, uh, when the vaccines will be available through the COVAX facilities. I will not repeat all the issues which Eva has already mentioned. So she has touched on some of the um, uh, important elements which we're doing within countries' office. But this is basically um, uh, what we're doing. Let me conclude with Finally, two last important messages. We need to ensure that COVID responses, that the COVID response does not hijack the entire health agenda and that other basic health services are sustained. And UNICEF has been very vocal about this from the beginning, as I already mentioned. The risk is there and real that countries and, glo and the global community will be diverting resources to COVID-19 vaccine rollout. If this happens, we will just shifting mortality from COVID to other health issues, which are much bigger death toll to the end. And the second point is that even when the vaccines are finally rolled out into countries, we need to keep, we need to keep continuing pre existing preventive, preventive uh, protocols, social distancing, face mask, 
and most importantly, frequent hand washing with soap. For that, risk communications and, communicate, uh, and community engagement is a key element of UNICEF works to inform, educate, and mitigate the rumors and misinformation. I can only reiterate what has been said by my executive director and Eva. A moment, there is a moment of opportunity of making histories. We can beat this pandemic if we act together in solidarity and if you act now. No one will be safe is if everyone is not safe. Thank you and over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Abu. Um, that's great. And it's wonderful to hear your perspective on that. And maybe just to kind of give some visuals to this, some of the things you just said, we have a very short little video to give you a little more images on, on how the cold chain and the will roll out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So we want to move, I would like to move now into a question and answer answer session. And I wanted to invite uh, ED4 to come back and join the panel group so that we, she's also a, a source of answers um, and open up the floor to, to questions. Um, I can see there are a couple in the chat box, but I'm also very happy or we're very happy if people want to take their, take themselves off mute and just ask a question. Um, and of course, we can go to the ones in the chat box as well. So I could um, at least uh, respond on two that I see in the chat box, if that would help Liz while people are thinking. Fabulous, please. All right, All right. so let me just, um, uh, let me start. Um, there were two I saw, one from uh, Bill Gudekunz. And what else could we be doing? So uh, communication is really important. Um, being able to talk to the publics about vaccines and about the need. If you have networks of people who can help us with donations, that would help. We have to raise about 2 billion US dollars uh, for this to work going out to, the, to countries. So raising your voice about that. We can use the building of confidence. Many people have vaccine hesitancy and they worry about these vaccines, but that's not true everywhere in the world. But if we can get information out quickly from trusted uh, sources, that will really help. And Bill, you could help on that too. Um, but there are lots of other areas. So if you have any ideas in mind, we are wide open. You know, we can use innovations in products and services. Abu mentioned hand washing. Mobile hand washing stations would be useful. In Sub-Saharan Africa, only 40% of the homes and um, health facilities have hand washing and a bar of soap. So water and a bar of soap makes a big difference. We can use products and services that can help us get that into communities. And then Ron Bohm, uh, uh, mentioned uh, to Abu, would it be helpful, uh, you know, loans? So in some of our UNICEF um, um, facilities and committees, so there is uh, UNICEF USA, Companies or individuals have loaned an amount of money. Um, in one case, it's $50 million. And they loaned it in so that we could use it as a revolving fund to keep our work going. They love the work and after 10 years, it's still there. So we can use financial instruments. We are an agency in the United Nations that carries none of our own um, uh, guarantees, loans, we can't do any of that equity. We don't have any of those instruments. So we have to pair with private sector individuals to give us those instruments. 
what uh, Eva was talking about with PAHO, it's a revolving fund. And so we paired with them to do it, but we could really use help in that. So I'll just start uh, with those two. Liz, back to you. Thank you very much, ED4. There are a number of other questions coming in, which I may, ED4, if I may come back to you on, there, there's some questions on, on Norma UNICEF is focusing on children. Um, first priority, of course, for vaccines in Europe is elderly and health personnel and vulnerable. And how, uh, ED4, would you bring um, that prioritization into sort of UNICEF's mandate? How would you bring those together? So, um... UNICEF, because we are half of the vaccines that move in the world now, and it's for childhood diseases, for measles and polio and all of the childhood diseases that you know, uh, we have the capacity to be able to move vaccines. And so when we as a world began to look at who would be the right facility, it seemed that UNICEF was it. So we said, yes, uh, we're in. We will put all of our expertise and experience and supply chains to work to help. Um, we find that in vaccinations at community centers, it's very much driven by how the community feels about coming into a community health system. So within a community, families and young mothers have confidence in UNICEF and in the fact that we are backing a facility with pharmaceuticals, with training for the nurses, with supplies, as Eva had said, you know, syringes and training for the healthcare workers. And so they are willing to come in. And that is a very important part of this. So if we can use that confidence in UNICEF to help families at this moment in time, and some of our most treasured members of our families are the oldest in our families, Young people, it's interesting, they are very interested in saving their grandmother or their grandfather. They feel it's their responsibility. So UNICEF is standing up. We hope you will stand up with us. The world didn't know this was coming, but it's here and we're gonna get on top of it. Great, thank you. There's a question on the recommendation um, from WHO and UNICEF on prioritizing who receives the vaccines first. And of course, whether the vaccines have been tested or approved for use in children. ED4, would you like to pick that up or would you like me to pass that to Eva? I have such a good team here. I'll start. <laughs> then Eva, will you please pick up? Okay. Um, so uh, WHO is indeed uh, the entity that we are all going to, to make sure that vaccines are indeed safe, that they have been tested. Uh, for children, we have not yet been testing enough of the vaccines on children under the ages of 16. So we do not yet have that fully known. This is new for us. And it's new for everyone, but we are following the guidance of WHO. So Eva, let me turn it over to you. And Thank Abu, you. Abu is a doctor, so Abu, you may want to Indeed, I was the doctor. So thank you so much, Edi, for you, you uh, covered it so beautifully. So basically, in terms of the prioritization, the guidelines from WHO is targeting the uh, health workers, the heroes that have been there to address the COVID-19 uh, situation. So that's the priority. However, country by country, uh, sovereign states will decide uh, the priority tiers following the um, these uh, guidelines from the WHO. Uh, the target initially is that we are allocating 20% of the overall volumes, but obviously we're looking forward to really capture and address the needs of the, um, of the governments beyond this 20%. This is just the initial. And um, Edie said very um, eloquently that we are only procuring vaccines that are approved by WHO. And that is very important we are looking at 189 countries. So it is very important also in the share of this uh, number of countries we are going that we make sure that every vaccine that is reaching a country is approved by WHO and that the countries are receiving a safe vaccine. So over to you, Abu, as a, as a doctor. <laughs> I, I think you, uh, thank you. I think you said it all. I think. Uh... 
Um, uh, just maybe to add, we we also know from 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 the science perspective that um, uh, children with no uh, preconditions to uh, 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 less severe. Uh, COVID-19 responses. So I think the logic is that since we're rolling out only 20% and we want to cover 20% of the population, we're looking at the those who are um, uh, the healthcare workers who are basically at, at risks, but also at the elderly populations. And I mean, the aim would be that in the long term that everybody should be vaccinated, including children. So I think that is the starting point right now. Uh, so the guidance will be changing with the, uh, with the timing. So let me stop here. Uh, may I just add in, we are also advocating that teachers be among the first to get the vaccines, uh, because it's very important that the schools uh, can stay open. If they can stay open, the children will have an education. There are many children around the world who've been out now for um, many, many months. And for some, if their schools will be closed for a third year. And that just that does not mean that they will get a good education. We have to then really focus on catching up and that's difficult to do. Um, Kaya miller Goldstein put into the um, chat box one thing about um, is philanthropy able to speed things up? That's exactly what philanthropy should do. We need to speed things up and we need to scale them up. Ava's being generous by saying that we hope we will have 20% coverage with vaccines. We are going to be lucky in these early months to have 3% coverage. It's not enough for a country. So anything you can do to help us get a jumpstart, to get things moving in these countries would be helpful. Some of these countries are very poor and as Abu mentioned, very weak healthcare systems. And so with that in mind, we just, we can use all the help we can get. Thank you very much, Edith. I, I would love, that's a, um, I'd like to go back to Kaya's question as well, the first part, because I think there's a few questions along those lines about what specifically a country needs to move as quickly as possible. What's needed on the ground? I wonder, uh, Abu, may I put that one to you if, as a start? Sure. I think, um, as Eva has mentioned, I think we need to make sure that uh, the cold chain is in place so that we are not uh, exposing those vaccines to risk and that they still remain potent. So there needs to be a beef up of cold chain equipment in some of those countries. But simultaneously, you know, we need to have an, uh, I mean, ED4 has mentioned earlier, there needs to be a distribution plan. Uh, there needs to be uh, the communication aspect is a very important one. There's a lot of misinformation on those vaccines. I think this is the first time in in the world's history that we have been creating a vaccine in less than a year. So there's naturally quite a number of, uh, 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 of concerns, you know, uh, why so fast? Why haven't you done it for other diseases and so on and so forth? So misinformation is basically out there. And it's important uh, that uh, all institutions, not just UNICEF, but, you know, uh, being vocal about it, that vaccines are safe uh, and that people need to be coming forward. It is also uh, very important to understand that Yes, coming back to your questions earlier that uh, normally we are doing vaccinations for children, but this time it's in adult populations. Adults are actually much more difficult to vaccinate than, than even children. Uh, so I think the communication is an extremely important element um, uh, to, uh, to be addressed and um, everybody needs to play his role. So these are the kind of um, uh, 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 activities which basically needs financial resources. When the vaccines will be in place, it needs this vaccine needs to be redistributed to the most remote area very, very safely. So you need transport. Uh, you need outreach teams to vaccinate closer to the population because we will not be expecting that every population will be necessarily coming to uh, the uh, closest health facility, which may in some of the countries be even 20 to, 20, uh, 20 to 30 kilometers away from their communities. So I think outreach services needs to be available and this needs to be in place before the vaccine is actually shipped uh, into the areas uh, and vaccination can start. So there's a number of, uh, 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 of things which needs to be ready. Uh, some countries are more or less ready, some others need much more support. Uh, but as we say, we, will, we, we, we are working together with all the partners and with the COVAX facilities to see how uh, the rollout of these vaccines will, will be happening. Eva mentioned it in, in the areas that we will not have the bulk of the vaccines available in the first semester. So I think 
uh, we should be utilizing at least the first half of this year to make sure that the countries are getting as much as ready as possible. So when the bulk of the vaccines will be coming in, that uh, the operation can be done smoothly. But I also it's important that to start early so that we actually can build the system and not get overtaken by the events, you know, when the vaccines will be ready. And then we are basically uh, implementing programs, but which will be just temporary for the activity and not necessarily building into the health system for longer term. Everything that we're doing is for immunization as a larger program and not just for COVID-19. Could I add into that? Because there's a question from Juan Carlos Benavides in the chat box that talks about best practices and using best practices. One of the great benefits of UNICEF is that we do work in every country. So we see the best practices. When one country does it well, we can showcase that to another country and say, well, here is a way of doing it. For instance, Eva and Abu have not talked about the fact that every country needs to be able to approve the vaccine for usage within its country, but they might be able to pick up an approval from another country, let's say from the European Union or from um, the United Kingdom or from the United States, um, somewhere else. But those best practices, those things that will let you speed up as a country are very important. The country readiness is right now one of our biggest concerns. Partially it's because of funding, partially it's just because these systems have never been used like this in such an urgent way before. And maybe Liz, if I can add to to add to uh, ED4 that uh, in terms of country readiness, uh, we are also seeing a lack of access to diagnostics. And this is very important also overall and including treatment. So we see other countries, high income countries that having access and the number of testing has gone rocket high. Whereas in developing countries, we are seeing really lack of access. And this is another call. So in terms of preparedness for the country, we also need access to rapid tests and also other antigens and anti monoclonal antibodies as well. So this is another, you know, a way of funding stream that flexible funding is going to help us really create that uh, infrastructure for supporting countries, not just vaccine alone, but the integrated programming, including the wash, including the PPEs and everything that is needed for the health workers to administer the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. There's a little bit of a follow-on question in, in that, how do you make sure, a couple people have mentioned this, that people get their second dose. How does that happen in country, and including from the same manufacturer? Abu, would you be able to take that one? Yes, uh, well, I think uh, that's exactly the problematic what we are looking at uh, within in the country um, 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 uh, readiness uh, uh, preparedness. Um, as ED4 has mentioned, I think all countries need to be, first of all, approving, you know, the vaccines which they will be utilizing. I think um, um, it's important to know that most of those vaccines are not yet licensed, so there needs to be also an indemnity and liability agreement which needs to be signed by those countries. Of Their national uh, regulatory authorities needs to then be approving them. Um, it is, it will be a challenge, though, in countries where we have multiple vaccines running concurrently. Um, but I think part of the readiness is also making sure that when a specific vaccine is basically approved, every um, um, uh, recipient will be having his, um, uh, his uh, vaccination cards on which the type of vaccines will be basically uh, noted on so that he can get the second dose um, uh, uh, from the exactly same vaccines. We hope that with some of the other vaccines, because there are some new vaccines which will be coming up, later in the year, which will be only a single dose. So these will be probably much more suitable um, uh, to employ to those countries who may not have started at this particular time uh, or uh, 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 in bulk of utilizing the screen. So these are the kind of this, um, uh, discussions that we're having, uh, which are happening between the country offices, our UNICEF country offices, and the Ministry of, um, uh, uh, of Health of those specific countries, as well as uh, as well as with the other partners as well. Thank you, Abu. There's the, the next question on the list. I wanted to, it's about the Mexico's government not allowing the private sector to vaccinate and speed things up. Um, but I thought this was an opportunity maybe to speak more generally about how we work with private sector and governments in different countries, because of course there are so many countries we're reaching. 
Could you respond, um, uh, ED4, would you like to pick that one up or hand that to either Eva or Abu? Maybe Abu, I've seen you take yourself off mute to kind of give us a general overview of how we do that in countries where we have that kind of situation. Well, I think the way how UNICEF works in country in country offices, we are working with the government. So I think uh, it's um, uh, uh, we 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 will try. I mean, we have tried in many countries of utilizing the private sector to roll out uh, um, uh, uh, some of these immunization campaigns. Uh, we have done this in Afghanistan. We have done this in DRC in Nigeria, uh, where uh, basically uh, you know private sector can contribute where it is. So. If Mexico does not want to work with the private sector, I think and uh, we are invited to the discussions uh, uh, with Minister of Health. We will be pro proposing this to the Minister of Health to enlarge the spectrum because I don't think that the government in itself will be able to undertake this massive exercise uh, uh, to a certain extent. So it, it's really been in the form of discussions um, uh, uh, with, with, with the ministries. But at the same time, um, normally any kind of large campaigns uh, to some extent, does anyway involves the private sectors when it comes to communication. Uh, company. Even in Mexico, I would like to believe that they will be utilizing the private sector communications channels to basically inform the public uh, in terms of this campaign will be going on. So I think uh, it is a matter of uh, really understanding uh, uh, what exactly will be forbidden by the private sector. Uh, is it because they do not want to utilize the private healthcare sector, let me put in private healthcare facilities to immunize and only going to the public uh, uh, health facilities. But I think uh, there is room of negotiation and discussions uh, 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 to basically make it happen. It will also depend most likely in Mexico of what, what volumes of vaccines they will be receiving. Uh, if you're only talking about 3% uh, of their population to be vaccinated, uh, it's, it's quite possible that in Mexico, they think that the public sector can basically uh, manage that. But if you're talking about the general public, I'm pretty sure that we will be looking for a hybrid mechanisms uh, where everybody gets involved to make sure that, uh, uh, that the entire populations, uh, which is quite large in Mexico, is immunized in the shortest possible time. Thank you, Abu. I think we have time for one last question verbally, although we will do our best to make sure we respond to all the questions in a follow-up. Maybe I could pass this one to you, Eva. Um, just asking, where is the supply coming from? Will it come from different suppliers? I think it's a simple question, but a really good one. And, and I guess physically too, where is it all coming from? Over to you, Eva. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, supply is coming from around the world. So it's uh, diversified geographically. Um, and uh, we are, as I said earlier, we are very pleased to see uh, more than 30 offers that came towards our tender. Uh, about 2 billion doses have been put as part of the advanced purchase commitments with the facility, uh, the COVAX facility. But indeed, we are looking at really um, all the manufacturers that can become uh, approved by WHO uh, from all the regions. Uh, for us, in terms of market shaping strategy, the diversity, geographic diversity, it's really a very important element for vaccine security, but also because, as I just said earlier, we know that the first uh, half of the year uh, is going to be very challenging to really uh, get access to doses. And we are seeing you know, other countries that have started to introduce uh, vaccination and moving fast, whereas developing countries are lagging behind. So it is very important that we actually increase access by increasing uh, reach to different manufacturers. So yes, it's coming from across different, uh, different uh, production facilities, across different regions, and we are working uh, around the clock uh, in supporting these manufacturers on conditional awards. Uh, pending, of course, WHO approval, but also pending what ED4 said, the registration and approval at the country level. And this is very, very important also because those vaccines have also to be fit for purpose where they are deployed. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. So I'd love now to hand back to you, ED4, for final words and a call to action for all of us. Over to you. Thank you, Liz. So call to action, everyone. Uh, number one, we really need country readiness. So if you are out in the developing world in your country, we could use your help to advocate with the government. Get ready. This is much more difficult than many of our countries have realized. And we have certainly experienced that in the United States, but it's happening all over the world. So country readiness, you can help us with that. Um, 
donations of every sort help, whether it's um, money, whether it's in-kind goods, whether it is platforms, whether it's contacts, people that you know, companies that you know, we can use help. This is truly massive. Second, um, we really need to make sure that governments are stepping up. So not every government has contributed and fully funded. They are not funding the COVAX facility, but rather something on the side. If you can help us to advocate that they fully fund the COVAX facility, it means that the very poorest countries and the lowest middle income countries, that they too can get vaccine, vaccines. And that's gonna be very important. So um, advocating with governments for that. And third, um, we really could use help uh, building vaccine confidence. Uh, there are a number of questions that have come in the chat box, which, we'll, which we will come back to you on. But building confidence is making sure that you find information from trusted sources, that you believe those trusted resources, and that you do something about it. Some people feel that as long as um, vaccines begin moving in a country and you see that people are not dying from the vaccines, that everyone will want to sign up. But parents are very protective of um, their families and they are going to be the main decision makers. And if we can overcome the hesitancy, um, that will help. So uh, we can use help on that. Uh, with all of that, I just want you to know that your philanthropy, your voice, your commitment counts. This is going to be a historic endeavor. It already is. We are just in the very beginning of it. So um, we had mentioned that vaccines were the light at the end of the tunnel, they are. And we would like that light to shine for everyone and for us, every child and young person. So thank you. Back over to you, Liz or Kate. Peggy, I wanted to make sure you had a chance to say thanks and uh, appreciation to the group for joining. Thank you, Kate. And um, I did want to thank Henrietta and all of our speakers, but also all of our audience for the really good and substantive questions that you're raising. It's obvious you're a well-intentioned and well-informed group of people, and I'm so glad we were able to spend this time together. What, what stands out for me in what we've been hearing is uh, how this is a systems-level challenge, and we therefore need to approach it system-wide and in all the ways that Henrietta just laid out there's so many different ways that people could be participating. So I would encourage you to working with your mind and your hearts, figure out what is the role that you could play and join us in this really important initiative. Thank you so much. And Kate, over to you to wrap us up. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us to all of my wonderful colleagues at UNICEF and everyone here. So with that, thank you to everyone again Take good care, stay healthy, and we will see you soon. Thank you, Peggy, Kate, and everyone.